Speaking on the hard shoulder here on News Talk, he doubts it's a realistic prospect for him to enter the contest in 2025. Listen, age is pushing on at that stage for me. I, M- M- Michael Lee has five years more to go. That that brings me to 74. So I, I, I don't think realistically okay. that's going to happen. That's it for now. More in an hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. For great value home insurance, go online to the AA.ie. Mostly dry with some cloud and sunny spells, scattered drizzle in parts, overnight lows of 9 to 12 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. Chasing down the competition with the momentum of a Man United Champions League charge. Gamble responsibly, see Dunleary.net. Well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. All right, it's Thursday night football show. Nathan with you for the next hour. We will talk to Daniel Storey a little bit later on about Nottingham Forest's capitulation in the final moments of the championship season, which saw them miss out on the playoffs. Could well be a dramatic final day in the Premier League as well on Sunday. All 10 matches getting underway at 4 o'clock. We'll have reporters at all the games, goals as they happen, and full live and exclusive commentary of Leicester against Manchester United with Stephen Doyle and Brian Kerr in that battle for the Champions League places, keeping a close eye on that relegation fight as well. So that all to come on Sunday. Right now, though, I'm delighted to be joined on the line by Mark Lawrenson. Evening, Mark. Nathan, you okay? I'm hanging in there. Did you get to Anfield last night? No, 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 no. You have to have an invite. <laughs> and you're not on the guest list? Well, it, I mean, I, I can't, under what guys can I go? I think uh, there's hardly any ex-players there that are, unless, unless they were working. So, no, mm. it, no, it was fine. It, I just watched it at home on the telly, but it was surreal in many ways, wasn't it? It, it was, it was. We were doing commentary on the game last night, myself and Brian Kerr, and, you know, you're commentating on the trophy lift and trying yeah. to describe what it means and at the same time it just doesn't feel right that no. there aren't 50,000 Liverpool supporters there waiting for this moment that for three decades they've waited for and listen there's there's obviously greater things going on in the world but one yeah. of the great things I always find about going to Anfield is that there are so many ex-players there you're in the press room you're around the place everywhere you look there's a legend there's a player who has four or five league titles and Jason McAteer is there as well like you're all there <laughs> You should have been there. You should have been there last night. It's 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 a real shame that that you couldn't have all got back together. Yeah, well, it would it would be great, but hey, you know, uh, another day, another dollar, no doubt. So, and I think as well the fact you know that that, that the night obviously that they won it when City got beat at at Chelsea as well, and I think it's just it was just, it's a strange one. Even even getting presented the trophy in the middle of the cop just didn't seem right somehow, did it? It's I don't, I, I don't know. Anyway, they've won the league. That's all that matters, basically. Yeah, and had won it from a long way out as well. Last mm. night, one of their better performances as well since the restart. Scored five goals. Uh, obviously, again, a little bit a bit sloppy at the back. But a reminder mm. as well that this Liverpool side aren't going away. And that's the next step now. So much of the talk about greatness is that you have to win more than one title. When you look at yeah. that group of players, and if Jurgen Klopp doesn't go and sign the way he's threatening not to... Have they got enough to go and dominate again next season? I think they have. I think, obviously, the um, only problems that they would have is that if you look at the front three, Nathan, they've hardly ever been injured. Only missed out on the, the odd game from, from what I can remember, and you may know better than me. I mean, that's unbelievable in the, mm. in the two or, or three years. Um, and no real serious injuries this year or uh, this season that would, you know, apart from the odd one out, but I mean, you know, the, the mainstay generally uh, have, have always been fit, always been playing. So um, it's a big ask for us, obviously, City, Manchester United, Chelsea, um, maybe not so much Arsenal, maybe not so much Tottenham. I um, can't think of anyone else. Really. They, they, they will definitely improve. Um, um, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be good because I think maybe next season might be the best or one of the best Premier Leagues we'll have in terms of the, the top six. I mean, mm. you can throw Leicester and Wolves as well a little bit into the mix, can't you? But um, no, I just I think everyone's gonna strengthen, and I'm not sure that uh, that, that Liverpool will buy anybody because I think they're also very aware that uh, of, of the prices. 
and they, yeah. I think they, they have an idea or they seem to think that the prices will actually come down and um, prices at the moment are, are somewhat inflated. Mind you, um, in Pulisic, Chelsea looked like they signed a proper player, don't they? Yeah, he was uh, he was exceptional, and you'd say Frank mm. Lampard made a bit of a mistake not starting him last night. Your line isn't isn't great, Mark. What we might do is I might take a quick break and we'll dial you back up and get you on a better line. Okay. Football on off the ball with Paddy Power. Less flashy than a Jurgen Klopp smile, but just as effective. Gamble responsibly. See Dunleary.net. The Pat Kenny Show on tomorrow's program. Tornished to Leo Radker on the stimulus package, the men accused of murdering a Holocaust survivor in her Paris apartment, the cost of direct provision and the cost of what the alternative might be. We'd love to go to the cinema, but how best can we feel it's safe? And, of course, the breaking news. The Pat Kenny Show with Jaguar. Tomorrow morning at 9 on News Talk. Harvey Norman is here to help. Our spacious stores have reopened and have great deals across our entire range. With sofas from just €389, beds from below €109, big savings on dining furniture with dining tables from just €179 and support local manufacturing with big savings on all Irish-made mattresses. So if you need it now, you can get it at Harvey Norman. Shop safely in-store or online with click and collect and home delivery available at Harvey Norman. We're here to help. At Guaranteed Irish, we believe enterprise is at the heart of thriving communities. Like Black Knight, the number one Irish web host. From small beginnings in 2003, today Black Knight hosts more Irish websites than anyone else, offering email, domains and a range of business services. Operating locally and trading internationally, the Black Knight team in Carlo supports 84,000 customers in 130 countries. Guaranteed Irish welcomes companies that are altogether better choices for our communities. So look out for it. GuaranteedIrish.ie. All together better football on off the ball with paddy power chasing down the competition with the momentum of a man united champions league charge gamble responsibly cwe.net all right we got mark lawrence and back i think on a better line you there mark i am oh loud and clear Smooth that's and that's silky that's as ever. for the audience, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're just talking about Liverpool and you were saying it doesn't look as though they're going to sign. And again, part of the problem is when you have a team that got to the level that Liverpool got to this season, yeah. where does somebody fit in and where do they get the game time? But all those other teams probably will go and strengthen. And Manchester City are talking about with the transfer ban uh, not in place and Chelsea with no transfer ban of spending big, maybe over £100 million for both of them. Mm. The, Manchester United at their best, strengthened from a position of strength. Is there a real risk for Liverpool of sticking with what would essentially be the same squad for two seasons in a row? OK, Minamino came in in January. But yeah. do you not automatically... Like you played in, what was it, five title-winning sides with Liverpool. Yeah. Do you not need to be refreshing the squad constantly? Yeah, you do. Um, I think maybe Klopp feels that part of, of that addressing for him has been the introduction of... Uh, the, the three young lads who um, won't play, I don't think, regularly next year, but they'll probably get more game time. Um, I just think he, he looks around and I think he's just thinking, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure who, who, who he's going to get and who he really wants. And, you know, obviously talked about the money, et cetera, because the front three are almost set in stone. Mm. So, I mean, are you going to ask? That's why we basically got Minamino, because they think that he'll grow into the role. Um, I mean, Abrigi's come on as substitute, started the odd game. We know he's not anything like the, uh, or has the ability of the, of the front three that we already have. But that's the most difficult thing: is is who's who's going to come? Because you know that that person or persons would want to play regular football. I know you occasionally read, and someone's got a contract saying, "Oh, he's got to play so many games," mm-hmm. which is absolute rubbish because. No manager would ever ever do that. But um, should they be yeah. that set in stone? Like, Roberto Firmino last night finally got his goal at Anfield, his first in the Premier League this season. Mm. He Maybe wears that number. He, uh, he wears that number nine jersey. I know yeah. he's not the out and out striker, and he drops deep. And he's some would say he is the key figure of the three of those. He, and I would be one of them. Right. I because he's 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 the glue. He's a glue to the other two because if you watch the other two who are outstanding players, they they go all over the place, which you know they're they're allowed to do. It's part of the system, but but generally, generally, Firmino is always he's always central. 
to everything. His movement's far because he's a problem, because he plays away from central defenders, but behind holding midfield players. He's got fantastic awareness. And, you know, it, 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 everyone makes a big thing about the goals and stuff like that. But, you know, they've just, they've just won the league, seven games to go. And in terms of his play, he's as good as anybody. Yes, he'd probably like to score more goals, but hell, he makes an awful lot of chances mm. and, and pulls in all sorts of holes for, for, for the other. If you ask the other two, um, Salah and Mane about, about Firmino, they would just wax lyrical about him all the time, and, and the manager certainly does. Salah's a peculiar one when it comes to Liverpool supporters. In, in many ways, last <laughs> night's performance sums up a lot of their fears around them. Like, how many chances did he need? And he yeah. didn't score, and you could see his frustration when he was been taken off without getting the goal. And there's a sense of, well, does he contribute enough if he's not scoring, and does he take enough of his chances? And then you just look at the statistics, and if he'd scored last night, I think he'd be the first Liverpool player since Roger Hunt to score 20 league goals in three consecutive seasons. Yeah. Golden boot the first two seasons, 19 yeah. so far this season. Are there parts of his game that you can understand why people get frustrated? Are our expectations just sometimes when it comes to Liverpool unrealistically high? No, I can understand. And I think players that play with him get a little bit frustrated because he's always looking to score when we know occasionally um, it would be a better place to pass it into to one of the other boys. But, you know, the, the stat you've just given me, that, that, that 20 goals, three consecutive seasons, is incredible. Because I think if you asked a lot of people when we signed him, they thought he was kind of, you know, a left winger, which he sort of was at Chelsea, or, you know, could also play on the right. And, and, and basically, Klopp's just turned him into a, a right-sided goal machine, you know, which is, I mean, that, that, in, that in itself, to see the vision, mm. um, that you know, well, of the three of them, just to see the vision of the three of them is, is, is amazing. And he's improved all three ways, improved every single player apart from the goalkeeper, the, the old goalkeeper, Karius, but... You know, it's it, it's one of the, yes, people do get a bit frustrated with him, and I think he get he gets angry with himself when he when he when he doesn't score. He does need a lot of chances, but how many goals did we, will we score this year? And as, as I say, you know, won the league seven games before the end, which which as we know was has been unheard of even in the history of the football club. We'll find out who the footballer of the year is mm. this weekend. It could well be Kevin De Bruyne, Liverpool mm -hmm. supporters can't have too much to complain about considering the two years yeah. Manchester City were so dominant Mo Salah and Virgil van Dijk were footballers of the year but it seems to be between Kevin De Bruyne and Jordan Henderson with maybe Virgil van Dijk and Trent Alexander-Arnold be in the mix mm. Jordan Henderson is obviously this totemic figure the real talisman of this Liverpool side who has improved massively himself and has a great personal story and how he's come on over yeah. the last 10 years does he deserve to be in the reckoning alongside the player of Kevin De Bruyne's calibre? Yeah, I think he does. I think he does. Um, you know, for, for all the reasons you just said, but plus, of course, as well, captain of a team that's that's won the league seven games early. Um, he's improved. I think the thing with Jordan now is when the ball gets played into him, he looks forward all the time, where there was a spell which frustrated everybody, mm. uh, myself included, where he passed it sideways, he passed it backwards, and he just he started, he, he's matured, basically. And also, by the way, you know, with a lot of the stories about the footballers in lockdown with COVID, coronavirus, and stuff, he was he was fabulous. He's you know Liverpool Liverpool came out with the furlough system and everyone went, oh my goodness, what they what have they done? But he's he's come out as a real leader. We know he's a leader on the pitch, etc. But you know, spoken with an awful lot of sense. I personally, if I was voting, I would vote for Virgil Van Dijk. Yeah. You're going to say, why would you vote for him? I'll tell you why I vote for him because. Would we win the league without Jordan Henderson? Yes. Would we win the league without Virgil van Dijk? No. Mm. Yeah, I'd be surprised if there was many people questioning that selection. In a way, he's almost just taken for granted. Like, yeah. You saw Graeme Souness asking him after the match last night, do you ever break a sweat? He just <laughs> makes it look so easy. He does. I mean, I'm not, you know, um, it reminds me of Hansen in many, many ways, but very, very similar. Um, Better? Better than Al. Whew. Um, it's a close run thing. I mean, Al, when, 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 if you think when Hampton started, he used, used to maraud through midfield all the time and like set people up and what he couldn't do, Al, was score. He, you know, he'd get through and, and miss it to fall apart. In the, but, but he was, 
Um, it, it's a very, very close run thing, um, but they are they are just so similar. I think probably with with uh, Virgil Van Dijk, I mean his heading ability is absolutely fabulous than Al. But it, 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 it's a close one, and I'm not saying it because Hampton's my mate. It just it's very, very close. So that they, they are definitely the best two that Liverpool have ever had, and they've had one or two decent ones. How is Hansen? Because you never hear or see from him at all. Obviously, he was such a uh, pivotal figure in so many people's lives growing up, watching him yeah. on Match of the Day. He was the main man on television for so many years yeah, and obviously yeah. decided to retire and, it, unlike most people, just stepped away completely. He always said that's what he was going to do. Um, I see him on a semi-regular basis. In fact, if you go to Hillside Golf Course, you'll see him nearly every day, <laughs> um, which is... He, 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 he also lives in the closest house to Royal Birkdale Golf Course as well. I'll find... But I think what he did, and I admire him for it, he just said, once he, once he walked away from TV and radio and press, media, he said, that I'm done. That's me, done now. I think, I'm pretty sure he didn't even do anything for uh, for Kenny when he got knighted. I mean, they are massive pals, the two of them. Right. And he, I think he said to Kenny, he said, look, look, if I do this, then I have got no reason when people ring up, I've got no reason why I have to say no. But he, he just said, no, he's done his bit, and... Um, and he's doing his bit, and he's just he golfs every day. He's a, he's a granddaddy. I think he's got, crikey, I can't remember now. I think it might be four or even five grandkids. Um, um, we all live extremely close. You know, there's eight or nine of us who live within. Mm. It is it is within a mile radius, so we see each other all the time, and uh, it's just so funny because. People come up to you and talk about, you know, different kind of stuff like that, and we're all, like, limping into the village and all that <laughs> stuff. It just, it, I, I find it hilarious, to be quite honest with you. It's brilliant, though, isn't it? It, it must be yeah. such a, like, it's a special thing that not many players, former players, have. Like, like John Giles is on with us every Thursday night, was on earlier tonight, and so right. often he'll speak about players of his generation who ended up in the scrap heap, who were treated so poorly by clubs when they were let go. Sure. And obviously more and more money has come into the game in the last few years and clubs are in a better position to involve former players and Liverpool has become this behemoth and there is work for former players and they want their ambassadors and they want G there at the ground. But it, it does mean that what you achieved isn't forgotten and it gives you, I, I, maybe I'm over-egging it, but I, I get the sense it gives you a real purpose as well that you are still relevant part of this club. Yeah. It's great, it's great, and I mean, and I mean, we were, you know, we, we jokingly we'd say every year that they didn't win the league, we became better players, <laughs> didn't we? And, and we said, bloody hell, they've they knackered it now because they've gone and won it. But yeah, it's it, listen, it, it is what it is, and, um, and and people all have their opinions and stuff. But we, whenever we go to the ground, we're, we're treated fabulously, um, and it's it's it obviously it feels like another world, but, you know, when we all get together, I mean, when the Birkdale lads are all out, so you've got Hanson, Dalglish, Whelan, Begling, Gillespie, me, Steve McMahon, Alan Kennedy, I've probably forgotten someone already, and, but within 20 seconds of being with each other, it's like we're back in the dressing room and the banter starts and the mickey taking and all, and all that kind of stuff, and, and it, that's what I think, that's what I miss more than anything apart from maybe Obviously, wishing I was a lot fitter because of my age, but um, the banter's fabulous. And, and Hansen's the worst one because he remembers absolutely everything. You start t telling a story and he'd jump in and go, no, 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 no. It wasn't quite like that. It was like this. But uh, it's great. And we've all got great memories, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Jesus, when you say that, it's a shame that Hansen has stepped away to that extent that if he's not coming back for Kenny Douglas's knighthood, he ain't ever coming back. No. No, no, no. Return of the man who never came back. That's what we say to him. <laughs> Jurgen Klopp, then, I don't know if you've got to spend much time with him over the last yeah, yeah, bit. four or five years. Mm -hmm. There was obviously the incident on the sideline last night between himself and Frank Lampard, and Lampard was giving him a little bit of that, and because there's nobody in the ground, the footage comes out, and you yeah. can hear exactly what they're saying to each other, and yeah, yeah. Lampard says, the first title you've ever won, you're giving it the effing big one. <laughs> which Klopp replies with a couple of expletives of his own. And Lampard comes out afterwards and congratulates Liverpool on winning the title, but basically warns them about becoming arrogant. arrogant. Yeah. Is there a bit of arrogance in Klopp? Because I would yeah. suspect if you walked out in the street and said, even for non-Liverpool supporters, give us somebody yeah. you'd love to go for a pint with, Klopp would be right up there, man of the people. Is, is that a public persona and is a very different man around the club? 
No, he's, he, he, he is what... He, there's a little bit of arrogance in him. I think there's a... I think that's a very Germanic thing anyway, to be, to, to be honest with you. I mean, about their national team, whenever they used to play against German teams, there was always a little bit of arrogance, which I don't think is a bad thing in football. If people obviously believe in what they can do, and then obviously if they produce when they need to, then they, they deserve their arrogance. Mm. Yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of that, but that's... But it's also it's also part of the game, and um, I think I think the biggest thing with Klopp, I mean, there's, how long have you got? But there's lots and lots of things. But he has this fabulous way of of just getting everybody together. You know, if you, if you go to Melwood and um, he sees you, but he's in a rush to go somewhere else, he still comes up, shakes your hand. Well, obviously not at the moment. And you know, how are you doing? <clears throat> Excuse me, and all those kind of things. And he's he's been great with the. Uh, with the old players, because he just said to his lads, he just said, look, this is what you want. Look at these fellas. Look what they've won. That's, you know, the boards at Melwood and mm. obviously at the ground. And he said, he said, don't let that frighten you. He said, but that's the standard that you've got to get to. And he's just, um, he's just, a, he's just a decent bloke. And I mean, I, I don't know if I ever told you a story, Nathan, but he, he hadn't been here that long. And a, a friend of mine, lived in the same village in Formby and uh, my mate Richard had taken his dog for a, for a walk and stuff and went into the pub on his way home before he got back to, to the house just for a quick pint. And as I say, it was early in, in Klopp's reign and it was on the road where Klopp lives behind the wooden gates and everything. And Richard said to me, so I'm, I'm drinking my pint and he said, Archie's dog is like sat at his feet drinking some water out of the bowl. And, I, and he said, I felt this figure alongside me he said, as I looked at him, he looked at me, and, he, and Klopp said, you OK? And Richard said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And uh, Richard said, uh, you like it here? And he said, and Klopp said to him, like it? He said, what's there not to like? He said, it's £9.99, all you can eat. <laughs> now, I mean, how good is that? It's fab, isn't it? It's just, if that's not a normal person, that you know, he's probably on about eight, nine, ten million a year. Yeah, what what bit of the nine pound ninety nine <laughs> didn't you get? Didn't you gasp? Great, great. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He he does seem to have very much bought into what what Liverpool are all about. Mm. You you spoke there about there was that time when with every passing year you became greater players <laughs> and the yeah. folklore and the history and the nostalgia and you're wheeled out to tell the stories. Yeah. When you do look back at some of those groups of players who came through and who went close, do you ever think the weight of the history and having so many of yourself, Hansen, all these different figures constantly on the television, no, do you think that ever weighed on them? No. I just I just think they weren't quite good enough. They, mm. Don't get me wrong, they were very good players and they had some very good teams. They just just quite weren't, weren't quite good enough. And I think, you know... Um, the, fo the football club's obviously always been successful, or relatively obviously been successful, and, and it's always been there. And I can only, you know, when I went, I <clears throat> I could have gone to Arsenal, Man United, Liverpool on the same day, and I just went, I'm going to Liverpool because I want to be part of a team that wins stuff and everything. And, um, you know, you say that, but you obviously, like, your, your fingers crossed thinking, crikey, I hope that's right. And mm. I was lucky that, that, it, that it was. But I think, I, I think there's just, there's a little something that's different between teams that win consistently with the ones who are the other ones who are very very good but don't quite win it, and uh, it's not anything to do with hunger, um, because everybody wants to win all the time. It's just a certain little je ne sais quoi, which is you know this particular team have got between themselves where they trust each other and they just manage when they play poorly to, to win games. I mean, you know what? Um, looking, looking at the way the team have played this year and, and majority of performances have just been outstanding. I'm, I occasionally think, crikey, you know, in the 80s, more often than not, we could be totally average, but we kept winning. Right. And that was the thing. We just kept winning. All right, the pitches were crap and everything. And you got, you know, every every team had a big centre forward that used to try and knock me and Hanson out and all that stuff. And you just had to cope with all that rubbish. But but we just we just managed to win. Um, and I think that's it. And I, they, this lot have it most definitely. Look, look at the way they play. Everybody knows the way that they play. They know about the fullbacks pouring forward, and, forward, and they know when they do that. Marnie on one side and Salah on the other side just tuck in and give them the width and everything. Nathan, hardly anyone can stop them. Mm. You know, and, and you know you can you can video everything about Liverpool. They do not change the way they play. Um, and I think. 
you know, it took Klopp a while just to get this press, press, press thing all the time. And eventually, everyone's grasped it. But if, if you see them train, by the way, at the start of the season, that he trains them like dogs. Right. He really, really does train them like dogs. And there's no let up. It's not like. And oh, is that all re- with ball at feet? Is that all replicating what happens in the match? Or everything is it? You see, everything you see, everything you see in the game, he does in training. You know, they've been known to have three sessions in a day mm. before, before today. So. You know, he just hammers it home to everybody. And, and I think the clever thing with that with him is, is, is no one can turn around and say, oh, I wasn't quite sure what to do in those particular circumstances because there's no grey area. There's just, it's black and it's white with Klopp. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. A couple of times over at Anfield, you get a chance to maybe talk to one or two of the Liverpool players after the games and mm. you ask them about Klopp. And intensity is the word that comes up every time. Just how yeah. relentlessly intense he is on the training ground and how much he expects out of them. In, in terms of the style then, like, it feels as if it has evolved. Because you think back to a couple of years ago when they got to the Champions League final against Real Madrid. Yeah. Like, they were probably the best counter-attacking team in Europe at that stage. And it suited them so well against the best European teams because they could burst on the break and they had the talents of Salah and Mane. Like now they're a team that push the centre-backs up right into the opposition half almost and just try and suffocate the life out of you. Do you think there's going to be another tactical evolution for next season? No. No. I think it stays it is because it works. Right. And, you know, if you're... And I think against even the better teams, if you're making their midfield players play with their heads down and not be able to look up and pick passes that they're not brilliant midfield players are they you know because then they just become ordinary because it's really really difficult and you know on on the best days Liverpool just hound the life out of everybody um you know Firmino we talked about him before he, he he's part of it you know mm. he's 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 responsible for kind of the width of the penalty area in terms of closing everybody down and everybody knows it's just something that they have to do and the other thing as well about it is, is you know, I, would, I, would, I don't really look at stats and stuff, but I bet Liverpool play more long balls than nearly any, any team, certainly in the, in the, in the Premier League yeah. and probably across most of Europe. If you look, when Liverpool kick off, what do they do? It, go, it goes back to, I don't know, whether it's Fabinho or even one of the back boys, and it goes diagonally to one of the, to one of the sides. And it, it goes like 40, 50 yards. And, you know... Um, Sam, Sam Allardyce got slaughtered for playing long ball, long ball, but, I mean, he was. It was basic. But Liverpool play as many long balls Could, as they do short balls. Just to finish off then on the, again, Van dijk Hansen comparison and bring Thank yourself you. into this as well, because they do, as you say, whether it's the two full-backs playing those cross-field balls, yeah. <laughs> they do them with such regularity they make it look so simple, or Van Dijk with that diagonal ball, yeah. 40, 50 yards. Did yeah. you and Hansen have it in your locker to play those accurate, long, diagonal balls? And um, did you play, play them on a regular basis? No, we probably couldn't reach. Um, big, big, heavy, muddy pitch. Right. Uh, no, we, we didn't. Listen, but the, the, the thing was then as well is, and everybody, everybody used to say about us sometimes, oh, they just keep the ball at the back, they pass it sideways and all that. Do you know what? We, we only ever did that when we were winning and we were just like want to knacker the opposition. But the first 20 minutes of any game, Ronnie Moran, who was only happy when he was unhappy, would slaughter us if, if we didn't look forward straight away in those games. Once you got comfortable and you were winning, then you could move the opp- opposition around. But no, we didn't. We weren't that kind of way. And if you think about it, I mean... Craig Johnson, Sammy Lee would play on the right, and they'd play right on the touchline. But Ronnie Whelan was like left-sided midfield player in most of the teams, and mm. he, he joined in in the middle. So we, did, we didn't have that kind of luxury. And if you're right-footed, you t- you, your natural way of, of, of a diagonal ball is to hit it from right to left, obviously. So no is probably the answer. But, I mean, um, yeah, oh, I mean, Ronnie, Ron, Ronnie Moran would just be on your case straight away if, if you didn't look forward and he'd be followed by a Mr. Sir Kenny Dalglish as well who'd be like looking at right. you saying why aren't you passing it to me you muppets <laughs> and you could understand him what? you could understand Kenny say again <laughs> you know whenever you're on Mark you know whenever you're on uh, we like to get two gigs for the price of one out of you you yeah. are of course off the balls resident movie buff and it's been a tough time for movie buffs because 
You, you can't go. The no. cinemas have been shut. No. So what have you been watching? What has well, been on in the yeah. Lawrence and household over the last few weeks? Right, Netflix. Netflix has saved my life. So my favourite thing on Netflix I've watched is Ozarks. Oh, yes. Marty uh, Bird. What, what? Marty Bird. Oh, yeah, absolutely, totally up there. But then I've been, then I've been, then I've been watching on, on a more sombre note. I watched Filthy Rich. Yeah, that's a bit grim. The grim. But do you know, do you know something? I've, I've actually, actually had lunch Careful with now. Ghislaine Maxwell. Right. How did that come about? Well, when I managed Oxford, when I was, I finished at Liverpool on the Thursday. I managed Oxford from the Friday, and of course I worked for a dad, mm. Robert Robert Maxwell, and uh, and Kev, Kevin Maxwell, his son, and I was invited to a couple of lunches of which. She was. I was. I was very, very honoured because all the family were there, the immediate family, and me. And and I and I'm sure I can say this on the radio because it's, it's not really a problem. I remember one Sunday lunch that we had, and it was all all their kids, uh, Robert Maxwell and his, and his wife and everything, and me. And we, you know we had a couple of glasses of wine and stuff like that. And and Robert Maxwell did this thing where he would be asking them questions. They're all very, very bright and well-educated people, mm -hmm. and he, he just stood up, slightly the worse for wear, and he pointed at Ghislaine, and he said, and primarily looking at the boys in the family, just went, she is the only person in this family with any balls. Well, look how that turned out. Right. Exactly. Well, that went down an avenue that we weren't quite <laughs> expecting. Sorry about that. Well, listen, there's no films. I had to speak about something, didn't I? And you led me down the garden gate. We did, we did, and we opened it right up, and, uh, yeah, so mm. you had a uh, somewhat of a personal interest in Filthy Rich then. Don't go down the Donald Trump line now if we were to ask you Don't about worry. Uh, <laughs> Ghislaine Maxwell out, wishing what, her what, well. What and, he said to, I said, uh, what did he say? I, w I wish her well. I wish her well. Exactly. Jesus Christ, you've only got to watch that for five minutes, you think, how on earth, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, it's uh, as you say, it's a particularly grim story. So uh, is. Ozark is, in, in, com in compared to Filthy Rich, Ozark is pretty much a comedy. Yeah, Ozark is, and I, I watched uh, El Chapo, which oh, yeah. was the Colombian yet. cartel. I've seen, seen loads, and they're, they're, they're quite sort of easy. There's a, there's a bit of a pattern emerging here. There's a lot of drugs in all these Netflix documentaries you're watching, Mark. Well, I just find, I just find it absolutely fascinating. It's just like, you can't believe that it goes on, but it does. And um, We live in sleep, Sleepy Birkdale, and you think, oh, my God, but I think even we've got a little pr bit of a problem here as well. But... Um, Anyway, but no, Ozark, Ozark's, um, Ozark was just fabulous. I'll tell you why I also did. I rewatched Sopranos. Ah, I still have never watched it. Are you joking? Much to my shame. No, oh, you've got to watch it. James Gandolfini. I mean, he, he's dead, and he died in uh, he died in Venice, didn't mm. he? Um, he's absolutely fabulous. And and the, I I then start when I watch stuff like that. I then start looking things up on the internet, as you do. And you know, when they went to Cub to make the fifth or the sixth series. James Gandolfini was getting really kind of... He was getting all sorts of parts, all sorts of offers for all sorts of films. And they had to delay filming for six months while he waited to finish a film. And he came back and apologised to everyone and just said there's six or eight major figures. He gave them 50,000 bucks each, $50,000 to go and buy themselves a car each and just to say sorry. Wow. Yeah, That's proper generosity. bloke. Well, on that note, Mark... Uh, yeah, pleasure as always. The cinemas, I you can go now, can't you? Socially distanced somehow? Um, are they, I'm not sure if they're open or they're not. You know, I've not, I've not even looked and I don't know what's on anyway. All right. Well, next time we talk, hopefully you'll live back to the cinema, Mark. Great stuff as always. Pleasure. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right, that is Mark Lawrence and we will talk to Daniel Storey next about a calamitous night for Nottingham Forest. We've had some great days and great nights and good memories. I hope that the people of Ireland have got... I know that they've got the memories. I know they cherish them, and I know that they've enjoyed the days that when they've done something that they've never done before. They go to a World Cup as part of it a couple of times. They've enjoyed that in the European Championship. Thank you for the days, those endless days, those sacred days you gave me. The president phoned me and said, uh, would you like, uh, the, the job is yours if you would like it. And I said, I would like it. End of story. I won't forget a single day, believe me. Well, you know, we're 28 to 1, I think, we're quoted as, and uh, we're not expected to do anything in this competition. We just hope to surprise a few people. This kick by Sansom in goes Aldridge, and Houghton! 1-0! Now 
nowadays, you see, they've changed it. Everybody in Europe does a little bit of what we did. Everybody in Europe. But they've changed the name, the FIFA guys. They call it pressing. Because they don't want to tell us that we started it. We call it putting people under pressure. Malta nil, Republic of Ireland two, and history has been made in Malta. Jack Charlton achieving his victory, achieving his ambition. We've qualified for the Gold Italy and we've done it ourselves. I'm absolutely delighted, not only for me, for our lads and for all the fans. I mean. The nation holds its breath. Yes! And then I saw David coming, and I'm not the greatest believer in centre-backs taking penalties. And then David went back, put the ball down again, and went, sent the goalkeeper on way and put it in, and it went fantastic. Well, there, we're in the last eight for the first time in my history, and it's magic. I'm, I'm delighted for the lads. And good luck to the people back home. Right. Hope they have a good plan. Burn came to me, and he said, our boss, he said, when we get to Rome, this, you'll get us in to see the Pope, won't you? Well, that was where the final was going to be played, and I don't think they're a prayer again, but the final. <laughs> Prepared properly. We had a little bit of strong. We ate well. And we ran very little. We're going to change that tonight. You see, you see, the world. it's a bit like religion, isn't it? And, 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 and football's a bit like religion, isn't it? And, and Jack's. He'd be like a sort of, he's supposed to be like a pope or a bishop or something. He would. But easy, onto it comes Houghton, and Houghton with a shot, and it's there! I went into the players and we, we, we just sat in the dressing room and we were getting changed and everything, and then somebody come and said to me, would you come out back on the pitch? I said, what for? He said, the crowd won't go home. I, I just remember, I just cried. I, you know, it was, it was time for me to leave. I'd been there for 10 years and it was time for me to leave. And, uh, and I did. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. Less flashy than a Jorgen Klopp smile, but just as effective. Gamble responsibly. See Dunleary.net. Take one stunning location by the sea. Add a water mill, two windmills, a craft shop and museum tour, a wonderful cafe, a pinch of sunshine, and you have all the ingredients for Scary's Mills. The perfect family day out. Get there by train, bus or car. Parking is free. Find out more at scariesmills.ie. Air Business works closely with small business owners to understand their needs. So we know reliable service, great value and cutting edge technology are vital to success. So for a limited time only, we're giving a free Samsung Galaxy S10 on the Air Business Mobile Connect Plus plan with no limits data for just $39.99 a month. For more, chat to our business team in store or on 1800 303 625. Air, let's make possible. Terms and conditions apply. Offer applies to Air Broadband customers and businesses with up to nine employees. Incredible offers this week in O'Brien's with over 80 wines on promotion from independent family winemakers to well-known brands like Q Valpolicella Rapasso, now two for 25 euro, or Chateau de Fontaine Odon Sancerre, now 14.95. Save eight euro. Pop in store or shop online at O'Brien'sWine.ie. Please enjoy alcohol sensibly. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power Chasing down the competition With the momentum of a Man United Champions League charge Gamble responsibly, cwe.net Welcome back to the football show this Thursday night. A reminder, the final day of the Premier League season will be live here on Off The Ball. Goals as they happen from all 10 matches and exclusive live commentary of Leicester against Manchester United with Stephen Doyle and Brian Kerr. If the final day of the Premier League is anything like the final night of the Championship, it is going to be a heck of a day because there was unbelievable drama at the top for the playoff places and in the relegation fight. Ultimately, West Brom were promoted alongside the champions Leeds United and Wigan with that 12-point deduction look as though they're going to be relegated alongside Charlton and Hull. The main drama, though, came in the race for that final playoff place, where somehow Swansea City managed to nip in ahead of Nottingham Forest and take that sixth spot. I'm joined on the line by broadcaster and football writer Daniel Storey. Evening, Daniel. Evening. I've been reading quite a few articles about Nottingham Forest this evening, and the words misery, agony and pain of supporting this club have come up quite a bit. 
I'll take from your own article just to run through how calamitous this has been for Nottingham Forest over the last few weeks. So the 4th of July, up against old rivals Derby County, they lead 1-0 against 10 men to give themselves a 10-point cushion with five games remaining. Forest conceded. A minute left against Barnsley on the 19th of July. They had the point they needed to secure that playoff place. They conceded. 17 minutes left last night, final day of the season. They had the point they needed and a five-goal advantage above Swansea City. They conceded three times. Swansea scored twice. And after 263 days inside the top six, somehow Forrest have missed out. Dear God, it must be tough to be a Forest fan on days like this. Yeah, it feels like you've read out one of my many nightmares to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it is horrible. Of course, it's hard to take. It should be said that if anyone thought that this could happen, it, it was it was Forest fans themselves. They've not been playing very well since the restart. They've been chopping and changing in the team. They just hadn't got anything together. Uh, maybe we didn't see anything of this magnitude, particularly the late goals, but we did see a home defeat coming and we did see this kind of creaking hold on the playoff slipping away. Mm. What were what was expected of Forrest this season? Because I know from an Irish point of view, there'd been renewed interest in the club last year when Martin O'Neill and Roy Keane had gone in. But in general, Forrest has been of a bit of a mess for close on two decades at this stage. Was it a club that was expected to push for a playoff place? Not from my personal point of view, no. Um, I think I'd have been happy with, with upper mid-table and, and probably happy with seventh, albeit maybe not via this particular route. But mm. I think you have to put into context the fact that they were in the playoffs for so long, that they were pushing for automatic promotion at one point, that they beat the t most of the teams. You know, They beat Fulham away, they beat Brentford, they beat Leeds. Um, they, they, you know, they equalised late on to draw at the Hawthorns against West Brom. They proved themselves capable against the best teams in the division, but they just had this horrible tendency to throw in cataclysmic results when we least needed them, and never more so in the final weeks. Yeah, and to make it even more frustrating, when you look at how the likes of West Brom and Brentford and Fulham played over the last few weeks, that actually, if they'd gone on to beat Derby that day and gone on a winning run till the end of the season. Forrest could have achieved a whole lot more. Has there been throughout this season some sort of a mental weakness within this side that this sort of collapse occurred? They've actually been a very different team to the one I expected until the restart. We, you know, Forest fans expected Sabri Lamucci, this, you know, this name that came in from France to maybe play kind of expansive football, but they were gritty and determined and they ground out results that quite frankly, they didn't deserve. You know, you look at things like expected goals and Forrest are way down in the table. Shots on target, they're way down in the table. But they, they found a way. Um, but they always had a tendency to go on a, 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 after a nice winning run to just fall to earth very abruptly. And when that happens at Forrest, and, it, you know, it's happened through different owners, players and managers, that seems to cause a loss of belief that ends in these, you know, these mini disasters. And... We, we've hit on another one, and you know it's no hyperbole to say that this one feels probably worse than all the others. You know we've had four playoff campaigns, we've never got beyond a semi-final. We've found a multitude of ways to to exit that at that stage, but somehow this feels worse. What about Sabri Lamucci then, who came in and took over from Martin O'Neill, where I assume the style of football at Nottingham Forest under Martin O'Neill was quite similar to the style of football that we saw under Martin O'Neill with the Republic of Ireland, which while quite often gets results, doesn't exactly inspire supporters. He came in as a relative unknown. I know he was with Rennes in France previous to this. Is he a manager that can now galvanise Nottingham Forest and over this break, over the next month before football resumes, can go into the transfer market, will get the backing he needs and that we can expect Forest to be a force in the championship again? Or are there just too many unknowns around the club? I think if you'd have asked me three months ago, I'd have said, yes, he, he's brought through a, a number of young players. Um, he's made a, you know, he, he's made a goal scorer out of Lewis Graben, you know, a prolific goal scorer out of Lewis Graben, who scored 20 goals. That's the first Forest player to do that in years. Um, but now I'm not so sure. It, it wouldn't surprise me if the owner, Evangelos Maranakis, who is by all accounts not a patient man, it wouldn't surprise me if he felt that now is the time for a change. And, right. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I can kind of see why. Because in this weird COVID-19-affected 
football championship, there's a very brief window between now and next season. And it's impossible not to think that this hangover is going to last and that these players and supporters are going to take a lot of picking up off the ground. And maybe the owner thinks that we're best cutting our losses at this point. It would be harsh on Lamucci, but then, you know, he had his chance, you might say. He, he had Forrest in that commanding position and, and he let it go. Oh, I can sense the frustration off you, Daniel. <laughs> He, he yes. brought you on a journey you weren't even expecting, and now, now because of the collapse, you're like, get rid of him. I just, you're basically you're saying we can't bear to look at him in the dugout in six weeks' time because it'll just bring back too many bad memories. That's it. He promised us the bike for Christmas <laughs> when we never expected it, and all we got was Satsumas and nuts. This is it. Yeah, yeah. It, Forrest, obviously, over the last couple of decades, have had all sorts of ownership issues, and if it's such a dramatic decline on a par if not worse than what's gone on at Leeds United over the years the current ownership structure how is the club been run at the moment it's actually been pretty good and and one of the slightly ironic um bitter blows from Wednesday night is that Forrest have been here before as I mentioned but they've been here before under a, a chaotic or um, even an unideal setup, you know, no long term structure, no off field structure, no long termism in the squad, managers being sacked almost every year. This felt different because it has been different, uh, and yet we still end up in the same position. That's what makes this so hard to take. Uh, I do believe they're doing the right things. They've connected the supporters with the club, they've connected the community with the club, which hadn't happened, and that can only be a good thing. But that last giant to slay is is that lack of belief and that propensity to to fall into disarray when we need it least and that will be the last you know that will be the last challenge and it's going to take a big effort from here and there are so many unknowns as to what the championship is going to look like next season in terms of uh, parachute payments for clubs coming down are they going to be able to be maintained as to what sort of television revenue championship clubs are going to be able to get and it's such an unpredictable league at the best of times that like, you can, as I say, you can sense your frustration when you get a chance like you got over the last few weeks. You really have to take it. It's a league you just need to get out of. It is, and you know there are many people of a certain age who would consider Forest a Premier League team. But the reality is, is they haven't been in there for more than twenty years now. Mm. Uh, and you get that on merit. You don't get that on past reputation or history or glory. You get it on merit. And Forest fans believe that that we would deserve the playoff place on merit this season, and it wasn't to be. But one thing's for certain, it won't change next season. We'll only get there on merit again. It, 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 if a club is in the right frame of mind and in the right structure, then next season should be a, another opportunity because, as you say, it will be financially very hard for a number of teams. And if Forest can rise above that, all power to them. But, um, yeah, it's going to take a heck of an effort psychologically. You talk about Nottingham, the town, and the supporters and the people of the town getting the connection back with the club. For a lot of people, for maybe certain generations, were they just happy to wallow in nostalgia and think about the glory days and think about the history and the only club to have won more European Cups than league titles? And actually, they were happy getting into their later years with those memories and having to go along every Saturday and this drudgery of championship football or League One football. Has that been a problem, actually, that for so long this was a big, a giant, a Premier League club that for some people, they just can't put up with this? I think that's probably true to say of of certain supporters who maybe kind of moan or gripe that, that these aren't the glory days. But I think that that past history is both a blessing and a burden. It's, it's a blessing because even though I didn't witness it, I wouldn't change it for the world. It's an intrinsic part of my club, just as Brian Clough was. And, and I'm incredibly proud to have, have, have a club or support a club that is associated with those times. But have you ever gone a day without mentioning Brian Clough's name? <laughs> I've never gone a day without thinking of him, I don't think. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, but it has been a burden because it has held back the club. And, you know, no one wants to erase that history, but Forrest has to stand on its own two feet in 2020. As I say, that history doesn't count for anything anymore. So I think the club has moved on, but... Um, it has certainly its new legacy almost is this is this propensity to collapse you know it, that is much more recent and much more regular than those glory days they are they are in the past and they will remain so for a long time perhaps forever with with modern football as it is now so i'm grateful for that but i i am wary of it becoming a burden well look there's any amount of glory days on youtube go cheer yourself up please daniel 
<laughs> Watch some Brian Clough YouTube videos. The days will pass quickly and football will be back before you know it. They just make me cry in a different way. So it's fine. <laughs> Daniel, great to talk to you. Thanks a lot for taking the call. Thank you. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. Less flashy than a Jorgen Klopp smile, but just as effective. Gamble responsibly. See Dunlewy.net. What is your bliss? To reconnect with amazing scenery and the great outdoors? Or to remain indoors with delicious food and great conversation? To reconnect with family and friends? At FBD Hotels and Resorts, we know nothing is more important than to reconnect with your bliss. Nothing feels better or more valuable. FBD Hotels and Resorts. Reconnect. Every dog is his day, I'll tell you. We're heading out. Yeah, as in outside the whole family. For the first time in ages, the car is washed and polished and the insurance sorted online with the AA. And after having nothing to look at but this lot for the last while, when I hit those open spaces, I'm gone. And I'm not coming back. Well, until they get the ice creams out, maybe. Right now at the AA, we're offering our best ever discounts on car insurance. With €100 Euro off when you purchase online. And up to 10% off your quote when you buy AA membership. Who's got clever car insurance? For all new quotes, please visit the AA.ie. Terms and conditions apply. Minimum premium of €280 Euro applies. AA Ireland Limited Trading is AA Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. What do you look for in a day trip? Is it long sandy beaches and rugged coastlines? Is it ancient castles and majestic gardens? Or is it picturesque towns and villages? Fingal has all this and more, right on Dublin's doorstep, but with the breathing room of the countryside. From Malahide to Hoth, Port Marnock to Skerries and Castleknock to Swords, there's a world of adventure waiting to be explored. Plan your trip now at fingal.ie forward slash visitor. Time to change that lumpy old sofa.